Seven. Welcome to uh, Cheese's edition of uh, Little People Talk. My name is uh, Uchi. Uh, on the program this uh, morning, our focus uh, turns to uh, another alliance uh, that has well, that was formed last week, towards the back end of uh, last week. This is the Ponte Alliance. Uh, the uh, spokesperson of the alliance joins us this morning, Mr. Sean Tembo. Is here. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Uchi. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's very good to see you this morning. Um, good to see you, too. Yeah. Um, so let's begin, um, first of all, with some ground rules, because I know there's a video going on, and I think everyone's expecting, uh, you know, fights and everything between me and you, but we don't do that here, so just uh, <laughs> some very small ground rules, it's good to see you, uh, yeah, yeah. we'll ask questions, you answer the questions, yeah, yeah, and we, we should be fine, yeah, yeah, yeah. as we've always been. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, can I ask you, um, just your quick thoughts on, 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 you know, what's happened in Botswana, because I do know that you spent some time in Botswana. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they've elected uh, a, a new president. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, they, there was... Uh, um, the president was appointing cabinet ministers. Obviously, mm. everyone is talking about the young, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, cabinet minister that that, that they appointed. Mm. But just your, your your very quick thoughts uh, around uh, you know that election and the opposition, mm. um, you know, winning the election, dethroning mm. a party that's been in charge for many many years. Mm. Yeah. So uh, from my standpoint, Rochi, when you look at the Botswana system of democracy and Botswana uh, elections. Uh, the ruling, or the previously ruling Botswana Democratic Party, which is the BDP, uh, stayed for a prolonged period of time in power, primarily premised on the fear that they instilled in the population that should you elect any other grouping, they are not going to manage the affairs of this country as good as we are doing it. And for sure, they were doing a good job uh, for a reasonably good period of time. The economy was booming. It was seen as a model of economic uh, management in the region as well as in the world. So they instilled that fear to say, don't experiment with anybody. And for sure, it worked. But uh, with the passage of time, of course, uh, you had a situation whereby there were a lot of young ones coming up, you know, the youth. And uh, the youth were not... Um, uh, easy to convince to say don't try anything else. So with the passage of time people began to become you know disgruntled uh, primarily because of uh, the youth unemployment. Uh, the economy was doing well when the population was small but as the population began to grow they couldn't keep up with creating jobs uh, for those people who are becoming adults. So that raised the disgruntlement and um, it was something that was um, uh, going to come with you know passage of time and eventually did materialize. Do you ever see a situation, um, you know, even here, that we, and I, I use the example of this very young uh, member of parliament this morning on, on the record show, the guys were talking about, you know, young people and being left behind. Um, for many, many years, successive governments have had a so-called minister of youth who doesn't look like a youth. <laughs> who is not a youth. <laughs> uh, I don't know how else to say it. Um, because obviously age-wise, you know, mm. it, it varies. But I think sometimes young people look at ministries like Ministry of Youth and the mm. expectation is this person should look like me as a, as a youth. Mm. Uh, because how else will they understand what I as a youth am going to do? Mm. Mm. Do you think that we'll ever get to a situation where uh, young people will be promoted as they are uh, in, in Botswana where you do have a very young minister of youth? Mm. Okay. You know, in Botswana, uh, to a large extent, they've always lived up to uh, the expectations of the population in terms of uh, uh, having a youthful minister for youth. Even the previous minister mm -hmm. for youth, uh, his name was Tumiso Lahare. He was a member of parliament for Mohobsani, and he was about 27. He used to be a radio DJ. Uh, he became very popular because of the way he used to host uh, his shows. And then the ruling BDP party adopted him in 2019 elections. He won and they appointed him as uh, Minister of uh, Youth. So, um, for us, you know, we seem to have a bit of a challenge in the sense that uh, <clears throat> we, we, our democracy doesn't have 
um, a genuine appetite to embrace the youth, uh, to you know fully participate in uh, the electoral process of the country, other than to use the youth to cause mayhem and to you know perpetrate acts of violence, to denounce elderly people. You know, um, we have never fully integrated the youth in our democratic dispensation, and I think it is time we did that. You know, not only as cadres but as as leaders. We need to begin to groom them as the next generation to run this country, and uh, we need to take that direction in my view. Um, so the last time you were here, um, you were still, a, a, and I was trying to go back in time just to, just to have a listen back, but at the time when we last spoke, I believe you were still a member of, of, of UPA. Yes. The United Front Alliance. Yes. Um, obviously, you know, stuff happened then, and now you formed this alliance. But I do want to take you back to like, yeah. you know, I think that's important that people try and understand, yes. uh, you know, what's, what's happened and, and the lay of the land at the moment. Indeed. Indeed. So uh, do you just want to, are, are you allowed to tell people, are you allowed to tell us all, what transpired that led you and others, because you weren't the only one, mm -hmm. and others, to opt out of war? Mm -hmm. um, I think it was an issue of a fundamental disagreement in the strategic approach that the Alliance should take, uh, principally in uh, with regard to the issue of at what point do we pick our presidential candidate in the alliance. Uh, there were some of us and uh, uh, my colleagues who ended up leaving uh, who felt that we needed to do that as a matter of agency because we felt that the presidential candidates needed a lot of time to be able to campaign and people to know that person and so on and so forth. Uh, and then there was another grouping, uh, which is largely uh, our brothers and sisters who remained in Oka, who felt that um, there was no hurry to pick a presidential candidate, and that uh, a presidential candidate could be picked even on the day of nomination. And uh, we primarily disagreed on that. Uh, of course, there were other, you know, small issues there and there, but that was the elephant in the room. And um, for me personally, Rochi, uh, I want to tell you that. Um, uh, at that particular time, it wasn't a question of who we should pick. And I would have been comfortable, uh, any person that the Alliance, uh, that Uka would have picked while I was, I was there, and I would have rallied behind that person. I would have gone out of my way to market that candidate. Um, so it was principally the issue of at what point. Because, uh, you know, when you look at our major competitor, which is the ruling party, they already have their candidate for 2026. So why should we unveil our candidates on the day of nomination? To me, it didn't make sense. And you know, when you belong to these alliances, uh, people might not realize it, but you make a lot of sacrifices because you are essentially saying, look, I'm not going to be on the ballot myself and I'll back whoever is going to be on the ballot. That is a big sacrifice because we all know in Zambian politics that um, if you feature on the ballot, uh, your, your, you know, your reach and your support base tends to grow with the passage of time as long as you are featuring on the ballot. And if you take an absence from the ballot, then it hinders your uh, political journey to a large extent. So when you make a decision to um, absent yourself from the presidential ballot, it has to be uh, based on something sound, uh, something that you strongly believe in, something that you know will materialize or has a high chance of materializing. The way I strongly believe that the Tonsi Alliance will prevail in 2026, and that it has a lot of potential to form government post-2026. Okay, so you don't have to deal with the elephant in the room, but I do want to take it back aside. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I had uh, a member of, of, of Uber a couple of weeks ago, mm. um, and in, in our conversation, there's something that he said that struck me, mm. uh, and this was, this, he seemed to have this uh, saying that um, they were members of the alliance, of the previous alliance that you were a member of, there were members of the alliance who were trying to crown somebody mm. and yet there was no discussion. Mm. So I just want to I just want to understand whether that's the case and then when we fast forward to, to the Tonsi Alliance mm. and your very quick uh, decision to uh, anoint somebody as mm. the leader, whether that's, that's true, that uh, they seem to have been this I'm already crowned as without a conversation ends. Well, you know, in, in Oka, I don't want to dwell so much yeah, on no, Oka, no, but um, uh, in Oka, uh, we never got to reach a point where we said who should be the candidate and then to subject it to a vote. We never got to reach that point. So our conversation regarding the issue of uh, the alliance presidential candidate 
ended at the point of at which point do we pick our candidate? You understand? It never went further than that. Uh, uh, there might have been, um, you know, uh, perceptions uh, among the people to say, okay, there's some shadow boxing going on. Uh, who are the people interested? Um, me, when I went into Oka, I made it very clear to say, uh, I'm willing to back anyone who is willing to stand. Uh, uh, so, uh, to me, those are perceptions uh, to say, uh, there was an issue of uh, infighting in terms of who should be the candidate because we never had the discussion. If that discussion was going on, it was going on in the minds of the people, not not like explicit. Yes. So, so then, uh, when you hear now, and this is the very last question. This is the last time I'm going to mention Oka okay? But when you hear, um, you know, ever since the Conte Alliance was formed, um, there have been some whispers. Uh, yesterday, I think it was uh, one of the members of the Patriot Front who said that. They're still working together with Uber. Mm -hmm. Just, just mm -hmm. clarify that for us, uh, because I think maybe that's a bit confusing now for people. And mm -hmm. there are two alliances, and the one party is saying that we are still working with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the previous alliance. Mm -hmm. what, what's the situation? Mm -hmm. So, Luchi, um, that is very correct, actually. Uh, as Tom say, we see Uka as our brothers and sisters. That is the reason why you've noticed that. Um, uh, despite uh, some of the remarks, uh, not so good remarks that our brothers and sisters might have been firing on the Tonsi Alliance, uh, we have not responded. Uh, to the contrary, uh, we've told our brothers and sisters to say, look, if uh, we have offended you in any way in the past, we apologize for that. Going forward, we want to embrace each other and march forward together as opposition. That is uh, primarily for two reasons. Number one, the battle that we have as Stone Sarah's is with the ruling UPND party. We don't have any fight with any of our federal opposition. That is number one. Number two, in order to remove the UPND from office, we strongly believe that we need to rally together as opposition. And that is the expectation of the Zambian people. They want a united opposition. And a united opposition cannot happen if uh, every time Sean Temba is on radio, is disparaging. Uh, Oka or disparaging the People's Pact or disparaging that one. Similarly, uh, opposition unity cannot happen if when Oka uh, spokesperson or Oka member on radio, they are disparaging Tonsei Alliance, disparaging Sean Tembo. Um, that is not appropriate. So for us, we want to take the lead to ensure that we have cordial relations. We might not um, come together uh, and, and, and become one alliance at some point, but at the least, we need to have very cordial relations. We need to be able to hold hands as brothers and sisters in the opposition. So that is what we are working towards. And we are taking the first step in that direction. Okay. So uh, do you want to also let us know why it is that you decided on former president as your candidate? Like this is a very quick decision. It was almost yes. like alliance announced mm -hmm. and here's the candidate. Yeah. And so it almost felt like there was no room for Negotiation based amongst yourself. <laughs> no, there was. Yeah. Um, uh, Luchi, uh, two issues. Uh, first of all, why the speed? Yeah. Um, you know, we strongly felt that when you create an alliance, that is a new child. And uh, this new child, it needs to uh, have a face and have a name. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to market the alliance without the alliance having a head. And that head should be the 2026 presidential candidate. You understand? Who is uh, no, no other than uh, Dr. Edika Chagwarungu, you know, the 60th Republican president and soon to be a Republican president. Um, so, so we took that step in order to ensure that as we go about marketing this new baby, the alliance, it should have a face. And it has a face. And it becomes easier to market it because everybody knows, oh, who is reading the alliance? It's uh, Dr. Edika Chagwarungu, his excellency, you know. Uh, then you form an alliance, it doesn't have a head. And the question which people keep asking is, who is going to lead it? Who is going to lead it? And you're going to get tired of explaining to say, uh, we're going to pick that person at this point, using this process. It becomes boring at some point. So it was a strategic decision. I, I hear um, you on the strategic part, but here's, here's, here's the, I think here's the, the real elephant in the room, mm -hmm. which is you could have waited mm -hmm. as an alliance. You could have waited until post-December mm -hmm. to announce the alliance and also have a, have you know, choose whoever you want to choose to lead the, mm. the alliance. Why? And the reason why is because obviously, in the you have something that is hanging over it, all your heads, mm. which is 
you know, the Concord uh, judgment ruling that is coming up sometime in December. Mm. So you have that uh, over your head. We, we don't see that as a hindrance, Richie. Um, um, you don't see it as a hindrance. We, we don't what, see it as a hindrance. What, is, what, is the, uh, what, what if the constitutional court, uh, you know, decides that, look, we need, we need to overturn uh, a decision of the past that actually, we, in fact, we, the, we don't the, see that as a hindrance. The, uh, former president actually held the Bible twice. We don't, uh, also, also we, we don't see that as a hindrance for the simple reason that um, this issue of eligibility is an issue that is not new to the courts, not just the courts, but to the court, the constitutional court. This is an issue that has been taken to court for six previous times. And on each of those six previous occasions, the court, not courts, but court, has ruled in favor of President Edgar Chagualungo to say he is eligible. So we don't see any room in which, or any scenario in which the constitutional court would actually rule um, against President Edgar Chagualungo. They can't make a U turn uh, on a decision which they have previously consistently decided on for six uh, times. You understand? So we are very confident. In fact, we were. Um, you don't worry the fact that they are entertaining. Uh, we, 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 we felt that um, uh, they decided to entertain that petition uh, in order to ensure that the course of justice uh, runs its course. You understand? Um, sometimes uh, it, it, it appears inappropriate to dismiss a matter, uh, you know, on, on, on a preliminary basis. Uh, it's better to hear the full story from both parties. And if you look at the course generally across the world, uh, it's very rare that they will dismiss matters on a preliminary basis. They want to hear uh, 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 what each party has to uh, submit fully, and that can only happen at trial, you understand, so that they consider the totality of the evidence, ensure that the matter is fully heard, and that they are not, um, they do not have any uh, perceptions of bias to say they dismissed this matter without hearing it, you understand. So to us, the fact that the Concord entertained that matter does not worry us. Uh, it does it does not undermine our confidence that the court will rule in favor of um, our happens, presidential what, candidate. What happens if they don't? What if they, if they don't? Well, we'll, like, cross, we'll, have, cross, we'll cross that bridge when we're reaching. Mm -hmm. um, and you've been to court many times. You've been to the constitutional court many times. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure when you were walking into the constitutional court, the many times you've been there, you mm -hmm. were very confident in your argument. Mm -hmm. Nine out of ten times, your argument was thrown mm -hmm. out. So you have to entertain the possibility that it could happen. It, 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 there is a remote possibility, but uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, we are 99.99999% that the court will rule in favor of uh, President Edgar Chagualungo. Uh, if they decided to departure from the decisions they've made on six previous occasions, then we believe that the reputation and integrity of the constitutional court is going to be brought into serious question by any and all right-thinking Zambians. Um, in choosing the former president, um, what were the considerations? Yes, yeah, so what were the considerations? Because again, uh, you ask somebody who has, according to many people, has a lot of baggage. Mm. Uh, he comes with a lot of baggage. Mm. Um, and assets as well. Baggage and assets. <laughs> but. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, fine. If you uh, want to be strategic, you uh, say assets. But I think uh, I want to stick, stick with the phrase of, of baggage. Mm. A lot of people believe that he comes with a lot of baggage. And that's uh, it. Yeah, yeah okay, that's it. Um, So what was the consideration? Uh, we wanted to pick someone who can win us the election in 2026. Okay. Regardless of the baggage. I, you know, when you look at President Edgar Rungo, uh, Luchi, um he has, he's more of an asset than a liability uh, uh, to, to any political grouping. You understand? Uh, the fact that uh, he served this country for seven years, the fact that the economy was stable in the period he served this country, he maintained the exchange rate to a reasonable level, around 17, by the time he was handing over power on the 26th of August 2021, uh, maintained fuel prices to a reasonable level, about 17 quarter again uh, uh, per liter average. He, um, uh, you know, maintained uh, uh, the, 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 the cost of living uh, to a reasonable level when you look at the, you know, Jesuit Center for Theological Reflection, uh, Basic Needs uh, Nutritional Basket. 
uh, which averaged around 5,000 kwacha compared to the 10 to 11,000 that is there now. It has more than doubled. So he did very well. The only reason that uh, we thought President Edgar Lungo had not uh, done well in governing the country is because of the high expectation, because of the high expectations that um, uh, were created by the opposition to say, you are at this level, you can do better. You understand? It is like a, um, a, a, a woman is married, happily married, and um, they are living in Chirenge, and this other man comes and says, ah, you, uh, you are having three square meals a day and you think that's living well. You are living in that uh, two-bedroom house in Chirenge and you think that is living well. If you come to me, I'll take you to Woodlands, you'll be living in a ten-bedroomed house, and instead of three square meals, I'll give you seven square meals a day. You understand? That is the situation that Zambia faced in the 2021 general election. And this married woman, this happy married woman said, ah, so I can live in a 10 bedroomed house, so I can have seven square meals in a day. Then she quickly divorced her husband in Chirenge and went to this man uh, in, uh, in Woodlands. And then when she arrived in Woodlands, she realized to say, ah, there is no 10 bedroomed house here. There are no seven square meals here. Instead, they are living in a shack, and it's not woodlands, it's a far away village. You understand? They're living in a shack, they can't even afford a square meal a day. You understand? And then this woman begins to regret, to say, ah, I left you. that happy husband, uh, uh, you know, happy marriage where my husband was able to provide within his means. That is the situation. So that woman now is thinking of going back to her husband in Chirenge, and the husband in Chirenge is Dr. Edika Chagwarungo. This boyfriend who took away this happily married woman to a shack to start only having a meal once in two days is the, the current president, uh, Dr. Harry Nixon. So there's no question that the woman is decided now. He knows that this man who stole her away from her happy uh, marriage uh, cannot sustain his promises. So she's ready to go back to the husband in Chile. I'm sorry, there, I wanted, there's so many holes I want to put in this, in this theory of yours here. Um, the first one is this belief about uh, maintaining, because here's what a lot of people will say. They'll say, uh, you can make the argument that, uh, that the exchange rate was stable mm. at 17. You can make the argument that mm. the fuel was stable. But you could also make the argument of where someone found that. Mm. If you find something at 4 quarter and goes to 17 quarter, you can't sit and say, I've maintained. That, that is, the, the, re, the, the numbers don't lie in terms of you saying things went up, they were maintained at a high level, but things went up. You can, you, so, you so, can I make the argument and say, you know what, there was, we maintained at 17 that the exchange was, mm. uh, fuel was at X amount, mm. but the reality still says that at the very beginning, when mm. someone took off this, um, the exchange rate was five to six quarter, went up to seventeen quarter. Fuel was was X amount, went up. So um, let me explain something to you, uh, Luchi, primarily on the issue of the exchange rate. When you talk about the exchange rate uh, and its impact on the economy, a depreciation of the exchange rate, uh, the, the the only time it becomes detrimental to the economy is if it happens rapidly you understand when it happens rapidly then it destabilizes the growth of the economy because there is instability people are not able to plan the key thing about economic growth is that the key variables should be stable so that the economic players should be able to plan you understand? Because when they are not able to plan, they are not able to make economic decisions. When they are not able to make economic decisions, the economy can't grow. Because the growth of the economy is a product of the various economic decisions made by its various players in the economy. You understand? So, when you look at um, the 10 years that the Patriotic Front were in office and the movement of exchange rate all the way to where it was uh, at about 17 when they left office, it was gradual. And there's nothing wrong with it, a, a gradual depreciation of the quarter. There's nothing wrong, you know. Uh, the depreciation of the quarter only becomes a problem when it is rapid. Now, when you look at um, the way the quarter depreciated uh, in the two years, actually, after uh, President Haga and HDMI went into office, from that 17, it went all the way to 26. You understand? That was too rapid for that short period of time. And that is what causes economic instability. You understand? So that is my bone of contention to say, 
That was mismanagement of the economy. The other aspect, Ruchi, which uh, President Hakainde Ichima used to talk very much about, very passionately about when he was in opposition, is the issue of uh, the crowding out of uh, the private sector. He used to talk about that very passionately. And uh, specifically, he used to refer to the issue of domestic debt. Because when you look at domestic debt, which is essentially um, the treasury bills and government bonds which are issued by the Bank of Zambia from time to time on behalf of government, the people who buy those treasury bills and government bonds, uh, most of them are institutional players. So these are banks, commercial banks, pension funds, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, institutions like the Wakeman's Compensation and so on and so forth. So when... Um, when these people uh, lend money to government using um, domestic debt, they are denying an opportunity to lend that money to the private sector. And the private sector needs financing for it to be able to uh, grow. You understand? So when a bank is making a decision whether to lend money to Luchi or lend money to the government, they would rather lend the, that money to the government because the risk of default with the government is almost zero. Because when the government doesn't have money, they simply print more money. You understand? Luchi can't put more money. You understand? So they will rather lend to the government than Luchi. So even if you had a brilliant idea, you are not able to materialize that idea because you don't have access to reasonably priced finance. And that is the reason why, Luchi, when you look at the Zambian economy uh, and you compare it with other economies in the region, you know, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, even Malawi, you find that these other economies in the region, they are run by indigenous citizens of that country. The, the economy is in the hands of the indigenous citizens. In Zambia, the Zambian economy is in the hands of non-citizens. I don't want to call them foreigners because that will make them feel like they are not welcome. I would rather call them non-citizens because they are welcome. They are helping us to create some employment. So the reason there is simple. It's not that uh, these non-citizens are brilliant entrepreneurs compared to Zambians. No, they are not. The only issue is that these non-citizens are able to come to Zambia with their own um, money, uh, which they would have sourced from their countries at a reasonable rate. So they come to Zambia, and whichever sector they invest in, whether it's real estate, um, whether it is retailing, whether it is wholesaling, whether it is manufacturing, they are able to thrive because they don't have competition, because the Zambians who have their ideas don't have the money. And when they go to the bank, they can't access money. And all that is because of the government's appetite to borrow from the economy using domestic debt. Now, when you look at that issue of domestic debt, the Patriotic Front government, when they came into office, they found domestic debt at about 38 billion kwacha. And they borrowed approximately 40 billion kwacha and uh, left domestic debt at about 78 billion kwacha. Those statistics are already available on the Bank of Zambia website. When the UPND came, so you are comparing 40 billion over 10 years, and then the UPND came, and they drove domestic debt from 78 billion kwacha on the 21st, uh, on the 20, 26th of August 2021 to 232 billion kwacha at the present. If you go to the Bank of Zambia website, you see that our domestic debt is now about 232 billion. So you're looking at a total borrowing of more than 160 billion kwacha over a period of three years. You are literally wiping out all the available liquidity from the economy. And uh, uh, that is why when you go anywhere around uh, the common theme, people are saying, um, why? Because the government has borrowed all that money. And then the other question that arises is, what has government done with this money? What have they done with it? Under the patriotic front, we saw that they would put up some infrastructure, Lusaka changed, basically, uh, the face of Lusaka changed. Greatest Road became six lanes. You know, we had these flyover bridges, which uh, President Haga Inda Ishlema was condemning as uh, speed dumps. Yeah, I did also condemn, but my, my condemnation... Your, your condemnation, if I remember properly, was that um, we've borrowed, uh, we've built infrastructure, but we don't know how we're going to pay. Yeah, but in terms and, of and, infrastructure... And here we are, the chickens have come home to us. Yeah. Uh, so in, in all of that, and, and just, just to go back to my original yeah, sure. question, mm. in all of that, I think the question that a lot of Zambians have is, why would you go and pick this particular person, um, you know, the former president, mm. as your candidate mm. with all of that background? Mm. 
That's the question I love. Them. So, Ruchi, a person who borrowed 40 billion and uh, was able to establish visible infrastructure is better on any day of the week, is better than a person who borrows 160 billion with nothing visible that they've done with it. On any day of the week, they are better. So, on any day of the week, the sixth Republican president, Dr. Edgar Chagualungu, who is soon going to be the eighth Republican president of this beautiful country, is better in terms of competence, in terms of performance, than the current Republican president, Dr. Hakainde Hichirem, who will soon, in my view, be retired in the national interest. Yes. So here's a question from Christopher. Christopher says, please ask him to tell me, what has changed now in a few months ago? He was disparaging uh, the former president, saying there's nothing he can do now, which he didn't do in seven years. He was now he's the greatest cheerleader for the former president. Yeah. So when you look at uh, the performance of uh, Dr. Edika Chakwalungo, we are not saying that it was perfect performance. You understand? It wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect. There were a number of areas that uh, were not properly done. You understand? And uh, the issue of uh, cadalism is one of those areas. And uh, President uh, Edgar Lungu has since come out uh, very openly and apologized to the Zambian people that he didn't do a good job ensuring uh, order with regard to the news that the party had, the cadres. And uh, he has since assured the nation to say, when he is given the second mandate, he will ensure that the issue of cadalism is not there anymore. He will ensure that it is totally eradicated. And on top of that, he will continue with the uh, good economic policies that he was implementing, the good agricultural policies, like distributing six bags of uh, fertilizer compared to the uh, uh, sharing of a bag, which is currently being done under the current administration. So we are not saying that Dr. Edika Chagwalungu was a perfect president. Far from it, he wasn't. But he was a better president, and he is willing and able to use his experience and the wisdom he gathered from that experience to ensure that when he comes back, he will be a more refined and better president, and he will be surrounded by people like myself and other new entrants who will ensure that we contribute to making him a better president. Tell me, what, what, what gives you the confidence? That he's coming back. No, no, no. Not, no, 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 no. Mm. He's coming back. What gives you the confidence that someone has changed? Even? And, and I ask the question really just because Clippers don't change the You know, uh, Ruchi, uh, Dr. Edika Chaparongo doesn't need to change. He just needs to refine uh, himself more. You understand? It doesn't need to change because even when he was there, the economy was doing well. Even when he was there, the agriculture sector uh, used to record bumper harvest. Uh, even when he was there, there was uh, a semblance of uh, justice under the judiciary. You understand? So he doesn't need to change, like make a U-turn. We are not saying he needs to make a U-turn because he was a good president. He just needs uh, to become a better president under his second term. And that will happen with the addition of new faces as well as tapping on his experience uh, during the seven-year period that he ran uh, you know, the affairs of this country. So we are not talking about a U-turn. So we are talking about him refining himself. Sorry, I just want to, just want to, I just want the two things that you mentioned. So mm. you mentioned the judiciary. Mm. Um, we've seen in the past couple of weeks now mm. the JCC mm. um, put out a recommendation that uh, judges who handled particular cases mm. uh, handled them very poorly. Mm. Um, I wonder what that speaks to when you say that uh, the judiciary was performing particularly well. You speak the, about, the, you speak the JCC is the one which is biased. Mm. You speak about the economy, you speak about how uh, the economy was in a good standing then. Mm. I don't just need the numbers to prove you wrong. Mm. All I need is to remind you that I used to sit here and I used to speak to those of you who were in opposition. I used mm. to speak to um, those who were in leadership. And I used to say the same thing to them. The economy is in a bad state. People can't afford food. That was then. I'm not saying things have changed to the better now in terms of the economy, but I'm just trying to remind you that. Things were bad then. But you, when you compare to now, then... I don't need to compare it. Then no, you know that Ruchi, Ruchi, things, look. things were bad then. And I think I think it's important that... Uh, if a, I may answer, people, Ruchi. No, hold on, hold on. Mm. I'll just answer, don't worry. Mm. I think as a people, mm. we, we need to be honest. Mm. Yeah, wasn't perfect. 
if, if we use your theory, we may as well bring back him in. Yeah, let me answer your question. <clears throat> You're saying there were people who were hungry under the uh, uh, previous regime, under President Edgar Chagorongo's uh, you know, administration. You know, at any given time, and wherever you go in the world, there will always be people who are going to bed hungry without food. Even in America, you find that there are two million homeless people. You understand? So the fact that there are some people who are going to bed hungry uh, is not a measure of the performance of the economy by itself. What you need to do is compare the number of people going to bed hungry. You understand? And when you look at the figures, when you look at the statistics, even the statistics in terms of the number of Zambians living below the poverty data line, you find that under the uh, uh, ECL's administration, that figure was around 60%. You understand? Right now, that figure is above 70%. Those are statistics. Those are facts. So there are more people going to bed hungry now under the uh, Haka in the HDM administration than they were under the Edgar Rungu administration. It's a fact. Also, when you talk about the cost of living, we don't have a very reliable, you know, uh, uh, like uh, up-to-date system of measuring that other than uh, what is published by the Jesuit Center for Theological Reflection. I'm sure you, ag and, uh, you agree with me. Uh, the basic nutritional needs basket for a family of six in Lusaka. And when you look at that measure, that is objective data. It is not subjective data. It is not my opinion or your opinion. Which, that is the objective data published by a third party. You'll find that uh, under the Edgar Rungu administration, the cost of living for the 10 years that they were in office, the cost of living moved from about 3,000 kwacha to about 5,000 kwacha over a period of 10 years. Under the Haka and the HLM administration, the cost of living moved from about 5,000 kwacha to almost 11,000 kwacha at the moment. That is more than double in three years. So, Luchi, on any day of the week, the Edgar Rungu administration was better in terms of economic performance than the Haka and the HLM administration. And the, the data speaks for itself. Here's a question from somebody who says, um, can you remind Sean how Pierre Cadet almost killed him? Uh, the president says he's coming to protect the family. How does that benefit the nation? He's basically coming in for revenge. You know, uh, the issue of cardinalism has always been there. Uh, it was there under the PF administration. It is there now under the UPND administration. To me, what is important to me are the assurances uh, by the Edgar Lungu, um, by President Edgar Lungu, who is our candidate, uh, that uh, the issue of cardinalism will not see uh, its day uh, under the new administration. It would be a thing of the past. That assurance to me is good enough. Under the current administration, uh, we have cadres who are in police uniforms and who are being paid by the Zambian people, by the taxpayers. Um, we have uh, police cadres who are able to go to the cathedral of the child Jesus and prevent the archbishop from accessing his own premises, laughing him up, holding him in his robes. We've never seen that before in the history of Zambia. The priest being held in his robes by a police officer. That is totally unacceptable. It has never happened. Uh, we have police cutters who came to my house, at Liberty House, and uh, they came with grinders and started cutting down the door. You understand? Cutting down the door in front of my children. Those are cutters. They abducted me, took me in the bush, started torturing me. Those are cutters in police uniform. So on any day of the week, Lucy, I'd rather have a civilian cutter than a police cutter. Because a police cadre, you can't even defend yourself. As a civilian cadre, you can uh, try to defend yourself. Because a police cadre comes with a gun. A civilian cadre will come with a machete. So I'd rather deal with a cadre with a machete than a cadre with a gun in a police uniform on any day of the week. I'm confused. I'm, I'm genuinely confused. And you know what confuses me? Mm. Because we've all seen the images of people lying in a pool of blood, mm. mm. beaten by Rather, I find it something yes. that the city has there sort of defend that and say, I'd rather have that. Luchi, I'm not defending yeah. that. I'm I not defending find, that. That was wrong. There's no question also, about it. Yeah. That is wrong. And uh, if you say I'm defending that, then well, you, are, like you, are, that. you are you are manipulating what I'm saying. It sounds like uh, I'm not defending yeah. that. That has been condemned. Even our presidential candidate for Tonsi has condemned that. And he has made assurances that that will never happen again. You understand? Yeah. These assurances are good enough for you. They are good enough for me. Because in my view, let me explain something. 
in my view, I believe that um, the issue of cadalism proliferated under the PF administration, not at the direct instance of uh, the head of state at that time, but because of the fact that he didn't do enough to stop it. You understand? He didn't do enough to stop it. That was being perpetuated by the cadres on the ground. Uh, and when they were doing that, they were doing it in the name of the president. They were doing it thinking that they are offering support to the president. And he didn't go out there and assert himself to say, can you stop what you are doing? This is not acceptable. Stop harassing the Zambian people. Because those were private individuals. They were not part of the government system. When you look at the police cadalism which is taking place today, where the police are able to go and harass, go and hold Archbishop Eric Banda in the robes. Fumba Bishop, Fumba Bambo, police, Wamenetiri Pirana, taxpayers' money. To me, the cadalism by the police, which is taking place now, is taking place under the direct instructions of President Haka in the Hichilam. Because a policeman is not a private citizen, unlike a PF cadre. A PF cadre was a private citizen. So they were able to do what they felt they needed to do as private citizens. But a police officer is not a private citizen. A police officer is part of the state, and the state is headed by the president. So when a police officer, that police officer, it means that that is under the instructions of the head of state. And up to now, we've never had an apology from Rai Hamonga. We've never had an apology from the IG. We've never had an apology from President Hakain Dechema for that incident that happened at the Cathedral of the Child Jesus. So let me take you back to the question about um, him wanting to return for the benefit of his family rather than the benefit of the people. Who said that? I'm, I'm asking you that that is the, the perception out there. I don't think that's the correct perception. That is a perception by uh, most European decaders. Yeah. And, and they've got the right to form uh, uh, that negative perception because uh, they're trying to defend uh, their presidential candidate for 2026, who is uh, President Haga in Nigeria. Can you think of that front page that's in a film, so you saw the first front page in Nigeria? I think uh, if you're referring to the news diggers' um, uh, front page, you are misinterpreting what, what was said there, what was written. Uh, do you have it? I don't have it. Uh, so, so in that, what, what yes, is. yes. So, um, if you look at even how news diggers captured that, they said very clearly, they said, we want to come back so that Naifetule Kutako. You understand? Because we are hungry. Not only are the average Zambians hungry, but even uh, us, the readers, we are hungry. So we want to come back so that we can improve the economy. Naifetule Yatule Kutako. That is what the president said. It had nothing to do with the fact that um, most of his family members seem to be caught up in corruption cases. Well, you are you. That, to me, that would be, um, you know, your your imagination. You know, you are imagining to say it, it probably meant this. But uh, if you look at the words, that was exactly. Oh, let me rephrase it. the question. Uh, let me rephrase. Mm. A number of his family members seem to be caught up in corruption. His wife has had her property confiscated by the state. Mm. His children mm. have had a number of their own property, mm. property that is reasonably suspected the proceeds of crime. Mm. Um, and then now you have somebody who says, I want to come back. The assumption so, from, from the whole world, mm -hmm. the assumption from Zambians mm -hmm. is that from our standpoint, those um, corruption cases, uh, they, they are not genuine corruption cases. Because when you look at um, uh, the, the fish, the fish ponds in uh, in Sinda, which the Drug Enforcement Commission uh, confiscated from uh, Honorable Tassila Lungu. Those fish ponds, which the pictures are there, uh, some of them about, uh, uh, there were about eight, uh, and the only about three of them had a tent inside, they were unused. The other ones were just dug holes on the ground. There was nothing in there. And the, the Drug Enforcement Commission uh, valued them at 14 million kwacha. You know, Kumunzi, labor, labor is very cheap in the village. If you tell people, Tengan Makamwili, Kumbani fish pond up, you pay less than 3,000 kwacha. Because Umzambo wari pirama 10 kwacha, 10 kwacha, and for a day's work. You understand? So, for the SEC, or is it the Drug Enforcement Commission, to value Migo, Dizijazenze, Kusinda, at 14 million, to me that is being disingenuous, and that is why all these law enforcement agencies are not professional 
they are aligned to the ruling party. And that is why, you know, as a nation, we can't make much progress. Because at any given time, we've got very few professional, objective people. And when there's a change of government, you find that there's a need then to literally sweep out everybody because they were not professional. If people were professional, if people were doing their jobs objectively and uh, there was a change of government, there would be no need whatsoever to change those people. Look at Botswana. They changed government. Up to now in Botswana, President Duma Boko has maintained the same uh, commander of the Botswana Defense Force. Uh, sorry? Yeah, but here we change overnight. We change overnight. He has maintained that. He has maintained the. Uh, it's been two weeks, by the way. He has changed the, uh, the. He hasn't changed the commissioner of police. He has maintained everybody. You know why? Because those people were being professional and objective as they were doing their way. But here, People, when they are in these positions, especially parastatals and these law enforcement uh, uh, agencies, whether it's Zambia Police, Drug Enforcement Commission or Anti-Corruption Commission, instead of being professional and objective, instead of doing their job uh, to the expectations of the Zambian people, they want to do it to please the serving president for political reasons. We can't make progress yeah. as a nation okay. when we have people of such mindset. Let me ask you a question. But yes. You're an auditor. That's, that's your background. Your back yes. You're an auditor, so if I ask you to audit myself, mm. and I told you that I earn, let's get, yeah, I'll be like 35. The question, where did I get the money? Because I... That is correct. No possible way that, that I can, is correct. I can build I'm, these numbers. I'm glad you've brought. I'm glad that uh, you've brought that question up. When you look, you know, I've studied all the uh, cases which are going through the so-called uh, economic and financial crimes courts, both at magistrate level and at high court level, and I've written an article to that effect. The fundamental flaw in the way those cases are being prosecuted, Luchi, is the fact that. Uh, they are comparing the income which someone owed, uh, which which someone earned, okay, the income which they earned, against the current market value of the property that they own. That is a fundamental flaw in my view. You can't compare the income which someone earned with the current market value of all the properties. Why? Because the market value grows with the passage of time, especially with real estate. You understand? So. Someone might have built a three-bedroom house in Karingaringa um, maybe uh, uh, five years ago or ten years ago, and they spent uh, 200,000 kwacha to build that house in Karingaringa. When you do evaluation today, that house which the person spent 200,000 kwacha will be found to have uh, a, a value, a market value of a million kwacha. You understand? And then when you look at the income of this person, maybe their income is only uh, 400,000 kwacha. And then the court says, no, since your income is, your total income, when we add it up, amounts to 400 kwacha during this period, and this, the value, the market value of this house is a million, it means you can't account for uh, 600,000. You understand? Uh, and then they convict that person, and then they get away that house from that person. That is grossly unfair. What these people needed to do is, they needed to um, uh, not use the, the valuation surveyors, but we use the quantity surveyors. So a quantity surveyor is supposed to go to a house, the three-bedroom house in Karingaringa, and do a bill of quantities. You understand? Do a bill of quantities for that house to say, to build this house, how many blocks were used? How many roofing sheets were used? How many window frames were used? And then they tabulate, you know, a bill of quantities. Once they do a bill of quantities, then they should do, have attempted to price that bill of quantities. How do you price a bill of quantities? You look at the price index. You look at inflation. So if it is a block, you've calculated the number of blocks that took to build that house, right? Uh, let's say 4,000 blocks. Then you look at the price of blocks today. How much is it? It's 12 quarter. You go back, you, 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 you discount it with the uh, annual inflation, average annual inflation. That information is available at Zambia. Uh, statistics agency. You discount that price from 12 to what it was or what it should have been in 2015. Then it gives you maybe four quarter or three quarter per block. You then multiply those 4,000 blocks by the three quarter, which was the price in 2015. Then you come up with what the cost of building that three bedroom house was in 2015. 
So you find that the cost is 200,000. And then you can compare that cost of building that house in 2015 with what the income earned uh, by that person was uh, during that period, which was maybe 400,000. And then you realize that this person was able to afford to build that house. So that would be a fair way of prosecuting these uh, so-called corruption cases in these courts, the so-called economic and financial crimes courts, both at major street level as well as at high court level. But what is being done? And I believe that the judicial officers, Ruchi, who are handling these cases, they are not dull people. These are reasonably intelligent people, in my view. And the reason, I don't understand why uh, they want to compare the uh, income that someone earned with the market value of the property. You can't control the market value. I can't control the market value. The market value is dependent on the current demand. So I hope I make sense, Ruchi. I hope I make sense. So in my view, these cases which are being prosecuted in these courts, it is being done on a, not in an effort to fight corruption, but it is being done maliciously so that the, the government can get as much property from uh, former PF leaders and those people who support the PF as much property as possible. They want to get as much property from them as possible. So that when we go to 2026, all the PF or former members and current members, all the supporters of the PF will be very broke, they will have zero money, and then the only people who have money to campaign will be the UPND, who are able to form a company today, tomorrow they win a tender for 30 million costs. I'm going to take a break. Sure. Um, I'm going to take a break. We will be back after 10. I actually can't believe you sat there and, and, and spent two minutes. Uh, I actually thought what you would say is that what do you expect? So here's what I thought you would say. This is what I thought I genuinely I genuinely thought that you would say that the property some of these properties I think that's that was my expectation. Oh, oh, let me tell you something. Because let me let me tell you something. Yeah. If you're going to um, take people's property away, Mampoka Numba Mumba, Mamsia Panda, Mampoka Mamoto Gam. You're going to do that. And uh, if you're also, in addition to that, going to take that person, the old GBM was incarcerated. You give a person five years. I'm long. You can't do that on the basis of probability. At the, at the reasonably expected to be a process of crime. What happened to the provisions of the Constitution, which requires that it has to be beyond reasonable doubt? So in my view, Ruchi, even that so-called forfeiture of uh, um, uh, uh, property uh, act is an unconstitutional act. You cannot, the let me just finish. You cannot get people's property away. You cannot uh, send people to prison on the basis of suspicion. It has to be proven, a proven fact. Something beyond reasonable doubt. That is what our constitution requires. So, um, uh, uh, the only reason, in my view, that. Uh, yes. That is not. That is. There are some cases that do not need to be that. Yeah. But that's the constitution. There are some that don't need to be. That is the constitution, Lucy. Um, I and, believe and, you. And in you, this case, in this case. I just a minute, Lucy. Just a minute. Let me make the question. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, what you have to do, if I am the economist and financial times and I say to you that I suspect that these properties, this club that you own, the one that's that here for everyone to see, I think it's tainted by corruption. I don't think that you were able to afford purchasing that. All you have, and to, you do, don't have, evidence all you have to do is tell me and show me that actually I've got the funds to do something. That's it. So, Ruchi, that's, that's all. Ruchi, Ruchi, Ruchi. And I think, uh, I let me address that. I think for many Zambians, I think this is. This is let, 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 me address that. Mm -hmm. let me address that. Two issues there. Issue that. The first issue is uh, the so called forfeiture of, uh, of property uh, reasonably suspected to the process of crime act. The second issue is that uh, you are pressing the burden of proof on me, the accused person, to prove that uh, my property uh, was uh, well earned. I worked for it. Those provisions which are in an act. A subsidiary registration, and I believe we have a reasonable understanding of the law. The requirement to say a person for the, that person to be convicted of a criminal offense 
it has to be proven beyond reasonable doubt is in the constitution. The second requirement that um, um, the burden of proof is on the accuser, not the accused, but the accuser is also in the constitution of Zambia. You understand? So you've got it. Two provisions which are in the Constitution of Zambia, which protect me and the property I have, to say you cannot come to me and tell me uh, that I should adduce evidence to prove that my property is tainted. It is you who is accusing me that should adduce evidence that my property is tainted. That requirement is in the Constitution. And then you have this subsidiary registration which says otherwise. Between the two, between the Constitution and this subsidiary registration, which provisions should take precedence? Obviously, it's in the Constitution because the Constitution is above any subsidiary registration, any other act of parliament. The Constitution is above. That is why I told you at the beginning that, in my view, these laws which the Economic and Financial Crimes Court are using, those laws are unconstitutional, specifically the forfeiture of uh, property suspected to be proceed of crime. Because that law affects property on the basis of mere suspicion. It does not meet the constitutional requirement of proof beyond reasonable doubt. So I can come to you, Ruchi, and say, I come to your house and say, uh, this fridge, Ruchi, uh, I think uh, you can't afford it. Then I take it away from you. Then now you wait for it. Is that fair? So my view, Ruchi, in, in conclusion, in my view, let me just finish. Yeah. Let me finish. Yeah. My view, Ruchi, is that uh, as a nation, we are going to make progress as a nation. We need to develop a sense of fairness among ourselves. You know, we are one people, we are all Zambians. We need to have a sense of fairness. When something that is unfair is happening to you, even if it is not affecting me as Sean Temple, I should be able to stand up and say, ah, ah, ah hey, my guys, wait a minute. What you are doing to Luchi is unfair, it is wrong. We need to develop that culture. Because without that, Ruchi, we are headed for doom as a nation. We are going to keep on fighting one another for no good reason. We are going to keep changing governments and continue fighting one another and continue sending each other to prison for no good reason. 50 years or 100 years from now, our economy will be nowhere. Our levels of poverty will be very high. Meanwhile, we will keep admiring our friends in the other countries, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, and say they are doing well, and yet we are not. Why? Because we don't have the right values as citizens. Let us develop the right values in order to develop this country. Isn't a value that accountability? Accountability is a value, and so is fairness. And, and, and that's even fairness. And so is fairness. And that's why I, I sit here and I yeah. say that if Mr. Sean Tenbo comes to me and says, this phone that you bought, I suspect you can afford it. It's pretty basic. I just need to be able to show that I, I, I But that is unconstitutional. But the, but so you, 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 if you, you, you are a reasonably if you, expected man. If you want to use, the constitution you and want, the, can we agree on something? Yeah, if you want to use the line of can we agree on something? That's fine. Can we agree but on something? From a moral perspective, because unfortunately politicians, politicians. But you can't convict people from a moral perspective. No, 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 you have no, no, to convict no, no, no. them from a legal perspective. And in the public, in the public court of opinion, unfortunately. It's all about morals here. It's not about whether it's uh, which, uh, which, uh, which, which part of the which law takes supremacy over the other. In the public court of opinion, it's very basic here. I'll answer you the question. This flask that you own, did you, did you, were you able to afford it? Yes or no? Just show me that you, ha you are able to afford it. End of story. So, Ruchi, um, uh, sorry, I know you are the interviewer and I'm not supposed to ask you a question, but. Um, do you agree that uh, the constitution is supreme uh, over any other subsidiary yes. legislation? Yes. Are you aware that uh, the constitution places the burden of proof on the accuser and not the accused? Are you aware? You are aware? Are you aware also that the constitution requires that before a person can be convicted of a criminal offense, um, uh, there has to be uh, evidence adduced beyond uh, reasonable doubt. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. With the civil cases, it's a matter of uh, balance of probabilities. But for a criminal offense, thank it has you, to thank, be... Thank you for saying yes. this. For, for, for criminal cases, it has to be beyond reasonable doubt. Okay. In other words, you don't need to doubt that this person... In a criminal Yes, criminal offense. So, if you agree with me uh, on that basis, 
uh, then why should we have people's property taken on them on the basis of mere suspicion? Okay. Then why should we also yes. let me let me finish with yeah. you. Let's let's not uh, have a tug of war. Why should it be necessary? to take away people's property, uh, former PF members and former supporters of PF. Why should it be necessary to take away their property on the basis of mere suspicion? Okay. As opposed, let me finish, Lucy. Okay. Let me finish. Let, let me finish, then you're coming. Okay. 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 Let's not do a, 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 a no. cluster here. No. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, I was uh, re-occurring my, 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 my position again. If the Constitution clearly says, eh? Constitution, supreme law of the land, above any other legislation, you know, uh, subsidiary legislation, clearly says that um, uh, the burden of proof is on the accuser, not the accused. If I accuse you, I should prove that you, you committed that offense. That's the Constitution of Zambia. Okay. Look, again, you are doing a cost on me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's the constitution. The same constitution which uh, also clearly says that uh, for a person to be convicted of a criminal offense, it has to be beyond reasonable doubt. If the constitution says that, and the constitution is superior to any other law, then why should the people, why should people, specifically PF supporters, PF members, and anyone affiliated to the PF, why should they be convicted on the basis of mere suspicion? Eh? Mere suspicion. You get their property away at, um, at property uh, suspected to be process of crime. Suspicion. Me, I can suspect anything. Does that warrant uh, for that person's property to be taken away? Equally, why should people be incarcerated? Right now, we have GBM who is incarcerated. He's an old man. He's incarcerated at Mwembeshi prison. On what basis? On the basis of mere suspicion, according to uh, that forfeiture of uh, process of suspected crime. Act. And also, because the, the, the prosecution placed the burden um, of proof on the accused. They told him, can you show us evidence that this property is not uh, tainted with crime? Instead of them proving that the property was tainted with the crime. You know? So we have a lot of unconstitutional activities taking place and in, on the basis of an unconstitutional acts, you are sending people to prison, you are taking away their property, you know what we are doing? We are merely creating appetite for revenge should there be change of government, which is totally unnecessary because we are going to continue with this CISO activity. Today, these are being prosecuted. The other day, these are being prosecuted. Meanwhile, as a nation, we are not making economic progress. We are not. We keep uh, stuck at one point. To whose benefit? So we need to change our mindset as London. We need to change our values. We need to uh, develop a sense of fairness. When something wrong is being done to you, Ruchi, even if it is not affecting me, I should be able to stand up and say, ah, but what is happening to Ruchi is not right. Can you stop it? Yeah. Once we do that, once we have a sense of justice as individual citizens, then we are going to uh, begin to be more united as citizens. We, the levels of conflict, the levels of um, apathy towards one another is going to be reduced. And then... Together, as Zambians, we will be able to grow our economy, we will be able to develop this country. That is my vision for this country, Ruth. I might be right, I might be wrong, but that is my vision for this country. Let's take a Mom, mm -hmm. you know I've been giving us Bokoma with all the wholesomeness and goodness in? I sure do. Well, I think I'm trying to remember the Bokoma. I think we're just going to have a new one to the president. Mm -hmm. I told him that I'm going to be the best people politician. I think it's great. I'll get on to it immediately. Yeah. Because it's to be the best chance of Bokoma Bokoma business. By your favor, participating in Bokoma Forest is fantastic. Football is in our blood, and with Bola FZ on Super Sports, you will get it all. All the fun, all the stuff, all the stars, all the stars, all the stars, all the saves, all the goals, all the football, all the Bola football. That's Bola FZ, all on Super Sports, for Davis TV, for a global best 220 watcher per month.
So due to the house or structure, it is made of for the future. As per high concrete and construction, we will make sure this yard is specialized in pre-mix concrete and concrete products like garments, capstones, building barriers, barriers, and get in touch with Amahari Concrete and Construction on 0977849567. And we make the future secure. With conscious partners, you need a solution. to doctors 24 7 from the comfort of your home you have a medical question or concern and in need of a specialist doctor's advice or you're short in finding a local specialist doctor then teledoctor is the answer for you at teledoctor we have experienced certified doctors that can handle any health condition everywhere and anytime teledoctor will connect you to specialist services and have access to our hospital networks throughout Zambia. Tune into Phoenix FM to a doctor radio show every Wednesday at 9 hours and have your medical questions and concerns answered. For more information, download the Teledoctor app on iOS and Facebook. Teledoctor, healthcare close to your doorstep. <laughs> Hello, uh, 13. Welcome back to the video. If you want to get in touch, you can 226 Spokesperson of uh, the uh, Twenty Alliance uh, is here with us this uh, morning. Um, here are uh, really good uh, two text messages in our first phone. Um, this is from Edward. Edward says, Please ask uh, Comrade Sean what team, if they are considering it, are they assembling? Uh, to help uh, the former president during and post election 2026, essentially to give genuine credence and take into consideration the views and concerns of the objective bystander as to what GCO and team is bringing on the table of constitutionalism, accountability, and sustainable leadership. That's from um, Edward. Uh, do you want me to read it? Again? Uh, it's okay. 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 Um, Someone else called Eddie says the provision to pass subsidiary rules. Okay, this, this comes back to uh, one of the conversations that we're having, but let me read it. The provision to pass subsidiary rules also lies in the constitution. Mr. Sean uh, Campbell is not a lawyer. His views will be taken as common sense arguments based on pedestrian reasoning, according to the Attorney General. Um, your guest keeps saying it's unconstitutional, but he forgets that when one was or is in public office, it's mandatory for them to explain their sudden. Source of wealth that's from somebody calling this, but let me also for my uh, hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning, morning, morning. Okay, thank you. Just turn off your radio. Yeah, morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Hello. 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 Good morning, sir. What's your name? Good morning, sir. Yes. The question is for I think the moderator there is asking you a question. 
very good question. And you know, you are trying to justify, though, for me, there is no merit there. Look, we have people, before they became politicians, these people could not afford a bicycle. You see? They went into government. These people now, they are telling us that just their perfume they can apply can pay rentals for other people. You see, they are telling us now that we have money. The question, me a poor man from Kanyama, where did this person get this money all the time? Where did this person get all these green to make money? What is in government? What is he was in the private life? He could not use that brain to make that money. You see, I think he, for me, I'm very happy that I voted for this government. That we have, we have seen a lot of things. We have seen many people who was a council of Aruch getting a 3,000. They are billions of watch. Where did they get this money? I think the issue of justifying in a, if I touch him on court, then I'm told to go and justify how you got this phone. I should not struggle to tell the nation that this phone is a station in So for me, those who have stolen, even if me, if I have stolen for my family, let me go and account. The administration table should not come on the platform to defend me. I should defend myself. It's high time this country will get rid of people who go into government to go and steal from others. It depends on the other people who don't know this. Instead of protocol. Okay. Like other Thank you very much. Morning. Morning. Good morning, Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Sorry. No. 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 I'm going to stop you there because the, the two the two gentlemen that you mentioned are not here to defend themselves. I would rather that. Yeah. So please, I'd, I'd ask you to just withdraw. Literally everything you just said. You can you can go to court. Um. You can go to the police. Uh, make the complaint there. But no, not here. Not not here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, please carry on. Please conclude. Let me add one last one. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Morning, sir. Morning. What's your name? Good morning. Good morning. 
Message from Mr. Edwards, is it? Yeah. Uh, I was asking to say, uh, how will the ACR team, cabinet team, look like um, post 2026 when it comes back into office? Um, I want to mention a little that team. Uh, we are going to have a cabinet team that is going to be a fusion of uh, some of the experienced ministers as well as uh, a collection of new uh, ministers so that we have a perfect team, you know, taking advantage of experience as well as new ideas in the affairs of the country. Um, that, is, that is what uh, uh, we have in terms of our vision as Chancellor Max uh, in terms of post-2026. Um, and then there was a gentleman uh, who said, um, I think it was HM from Carlin, uh, we say the people uh, need to be able to account for what they have acquired. Uh, he gave an example that there are some people uh, who might not have afforded uh, uh, perfume before going into government, and then after they go into government, uh, they are seen to have assets. You understand? So now I want to emphasize one point here, which is that um, uh, we are a country of laws. We are not uh, a subjective country, a country of opinions and perceptions. The fact that a person cannot afford perfume may not necessarily mean that that person is poor. People spend their money differently. There are people who don't spend money on clothes, and yet they've got a lot of money. You yeah. understand? So if we are going to be a country of perception to say, ah, we just send those all perfume, lay off, I didn't have my property. What if they had their, those property? And the only reason that they've decided to now start applying perfume is because they interact a lot with people in high places, so they want to smell flesh. So we are a country of us. And it is on that basis that we need to follow what is provided in the Constitution. The burden of proof should lie on the accuser. When you accuse me, you should prove your allegations against me. It is not for me to prove my innocence to you, no. That is not what the Constitution says. And what is being done at the moment with regard to the economic and financial crimes courts, both at major street and uh, at high court level, is completely unconstitutional. And in my view, it is victimization, you know, perpetrated victimization, which has been well designed by uh, the current uh, government to ensure that all the supporters, members, and former uh, ministers are deprived of their property and are sent to prison for no good reason. Me, Ruchi, I believe in justice. And if a person is suspected to have committed an offense, and that person is given due process, you know, due process, uh, they are taken to trial, uh, you adduce evidence against that person, and the court convicts that person, then I don't have a problem there. I don't have a problem. The law has taken its course. But if you take a person to, prison, to, to, to court, and instead of you, the prosecution, adducing evidence against that person, you are asking that person to adduce evidence uh, to prove his innocence. That is unconstitutional. And then when he fails uh, to adduce that uh, evidence uh, to prove his innocence, or he hasn't kept the receipts, how many people keep receipts? Ukagula bagi asmenti, oru taenda, oru mulwangwa, oru mchiruru, oru mbaden, 
kaenda kwa nyumba ile wanza tauza ni mandazi wenye wa nyumba hii hata wengine ni mandazi nani ni ya pili pili tupasa kwa nyumba receipt ya masmenti ya maneno nayo zina kumanga nyumba hii and then pili says ah this is not in receipt or receipt na jeka na muswe then we tell mr pili in bed and there that pili nyumba yenu you can't prove that it is not tainted it is not the process of crime tipo ka nyumba hii how fair is that it is totally unfair luchi let us be a fair society you understand let us be a fair society my appeal you know if there are some members of the previous pf administration who committed any offenses let them be prosecuted but let that prosecution be fair and objective so that if it is applied on any other person uh, post 2026 it will be a standard approach and it will equally be fair and objective to those people but we have a situation unfortunately also a situation whereby the current administration the way they are doing things the way they are treating others they are doing it in a very unfair manner you know the thing about uh, fairness also uh, you only see its importance when it is being applied on you when others are being unfairly treated most people won't really give it much attention oh ah nishon temba mleke nuja ama kamba kamba manini oh ni uja mleke but when it is applied on you when you are being untreated and fairly they can think then you realize to say ah it is important to treat other people with fairness you lose nothing in 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 my language um in eastern province we have a saying that tawana mzako chapita mawe chipai so what has before any offense has passed tomorrow the same uh, calamity is going to be for you so my appeal to the current administration um of president haranda chief is that i'm not saying he should not fight uh, corruption previous corruption that happened that may have happened under uh, the the pf administration uh, he has a job to fight that corruption but as he does that let him do it in a fair and equitable manner so that if the same standards are applied on him or his colleagues post 2026 or indeed at any other time when they leave office they will not feel that they are being uh, targeted let us be a fair society that is all i'm appealing uh, for let us be fair all right hello morning hello morning morning sir what's your name Justin, I'm going to go ahead. Yes, you are very clear, Mr. Vanwa. You are very clear. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. 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 Good mor
morning, Mr. President. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mangala. Thank you very much. Uh, my take is as follows. I think if we ignore the liberty for that matter, what Sonny Campbell is saying, then that is uh, how this country has been run. You have an opportunity to change it from what Sonny Campbell is saying. And you can you have an opportunity. Sonny Campbell is talking about what to bring about unity. What to probably drive away from us. And then attempt of vengeance or to revenge, which appears to be the case now. Some of these cases are maybe probably uh, corrected. Some of the cases that are coming out, we don't see a complainant at all. Maybe for fear of some kind, I don't know. But I, I think when court cases go to court, in most cases, you have a complainant. But what is obvious is suspicion. Just like Sean Campbell's message there. Just to suspect. We are being very, very unfair to ourselves in the country. We are being unfair. And if we follow strictly what Sean Campbell says, we will continue for 100 years taking measures against each other. It's no good treating your fellow citizens in the manner that we are being treated by the UPNG. Let them change for the better. And the change I'm seeing, the obvious change, is what Sean Jemwe said. Thank you. Oh. The final slide before you go. Hello? No, I'm going to go. Um, 2, 6, 6, 4, 1, 0, 9, 7, 8, 8, 9, 5, 8, 9, 5. Hello, good morning. Okay, thank you. How are you, sir? What's your name? Uh, I'm very well. How are you, sir? administration, there is no corruption under the current administration. I, I wish to uh, disagree with Mr. Gaston. The levels of corruption under the current administration are actually very high. Um, <clears throat> when you look at the Financial Intelligence Center report, report for 2022, you note that uh, in 2023, more than $3 billion, which is the converting the uh, amounts to uh, close to uh, 90 billion quarter was externalized from Zambia. That's a lot of money. And uh, up to now, we haven't received any statement to explain how that externalization of that huge amount uh, took place or who perpetrated it. 
Even the same thing with some government. I did. We have the chief government spokesperson, Honorable Canarias Mirwa, addressing the nation almost every other day. But he talks about other issues. He's attacking our council around presidential candidates, uh, on a daily basis. But he's not explaining who stole that 90 billion voucher in 2023 from them. Because from my standpoint, Hushi, the only people who have access to that kind of money are the people in government. You understand? Those affiliated with and close to President Haka in the Ichiren. So if that 90 billion was stolen, as reported by the Financial Intelligence Center in 2023 alone, then President Haka in the Ichiren should know who stole it. You understand? And yet he's not saying anything. So to us, that, those are the high levels of corruption taking place under the UPND administration. Also, we had the incidents uh, which were reported in the Auditor General's report uh, to say that uh, there is a company which uh, was formed, and three days later, that company was awarded a 31 million quarter uh, 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 contract by the Food Reserve Agency. That is corruption. How can you have a company, no track record, no nothing, formed three days after forming, it is awarded a multi million quarter contract? So the levels of corruption, the levels of corruption are very high under the current administration. Um, I will move on to Mr. Mangara. Uh, Mr. Mangara agrees with the, our standpoint to say, as a nation, let us be fair to one another. Which, when you look at the background of Gambia, various administrations have been, and various heads of state have been fighting battles against one another. When KK left office in 1991, my expectation was that we would build on what KK had done. You understand? And yet, there was too much personal fights between KK and FTJ to the extent that uh, the new president wanted to erase the entire legacy of the previous president, both the good things and the bad things that were done. You know, any president would do both good and uh, bad things to the, uh, for the nation. So, you as a new president, your job is to build on the good things and then to collect the wrong things done. But if you, you are a new president, you come into office and you hold so much hatred for your predecessor, then you'll be advancing a personal agenda, which will be to erase completely the legacy of the previous president, whether uh, they did some good things or bad things. We can't build this country with that mentality. And my expectation and my hope was that uh, with all the lessons learned in the past, when President Narendra Chilema ascended into office, he would be a statesman. He would focus on building um, uh, Zambia as a nation and not focus on um, uh, personal petty fights against the previous administration. But that was not to be. There was that forfeiture of uh, uh, suspected the process of crime act. That uh, act was there, um, but uh, it was a 40 act. It's a 40 act. And instead of amending it, uh, our colleagues in the UPND saw that uh, act as uh, a perfect weapon to use against uh, uh, members of the former regime, the Patriotic Front. That is not, 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 not that it was enacted in 2010 by the MND. Yes, yes. 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 But they never, the, the PF administration never used that law. Yeah, you know that they are. Make it wrong. I don't, I don't know. You, you know, Richard, that there are a lot of um, uh, uh, progressive laws in this country. A lot of them. A lot of them. So, um, who's charged? The only time, the only time that we, it's because we don't have a proper system to review previous laws and uh, abolish those laws which are no longer uh, uh, good for the nation and enact new laws. Our national assembly, most of the time. They sleep on the job, not only under the current administration. Actually, that's the word. That's yes, what I was yes, talking about. Yes, yes. Not only, not only, not, not, not only, yes, yes, not only under the current administration, but even previous yeah. administration. And also, they don't pay adequate attention to the laws that they actually pass. Okay. So we have those challenges. I won't argue. I won't argue. <laughs> yeah. So the bottom line, now, Lucy, is that if you're going to be a statesman, if your uh, plan and objective as a head of state is to live a good legacy to say, ah, Peter Zeriko now as our president, uh, you know, they refer to you as the great man that ever ran the affairs of this country. Then when you see a law such as that for future of uh, process of suspected whatever, you need to see that this is a retrogressive law and you need to abolish it. You understand? But 
Uh, President Harende Chile Maruta, that uh, he saw that it was, regret, uh, 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 it was retrogressive, but instead of abolishing it, he used, he started using it against members of a pathetic party, getting away their property, locking them up into prison for no good reason. That is not, those are not the actions of a statesman. And my appeal to uh, the president is that, you know, he needs to be a statesman. You understand? Let us see, reduce the appetite for revenge against one another. Then uh, we had uh, Mr. Chikwara, of course, he was also demanding the issues of uh, high levels of poverty across the nation. I had to share it across most of the world. Um, to the speaker for zero and maybe. Good morning. Good morning, sir. What's your name? Sorry, sir. Hello, Mr. Um, it's another line. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning, morning, sir. What's your name? Okay. Yes, this is Phoenix. What's your name, sir? You're live on radio. What's your name? You're live on radio. What's your name? Go ahead. Uh, good morning, sir. Okay, in your contribution, Yandi, the Okulanda for fear, but of a person came of Alanda. You know, as a nation, we are planting a seed that will even affect the generation to come. We are not careful. The issue to do with revenge is growing and growing. I can tell you for the past government, I think we didn't see it much, not until now. We are seeing what we are seeing now, I can assure you, there is nothing like what they did. It's just about revenge, pure revenge. Look at how they have visualized the, 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 the peer part. Even one who knows, you can tell that this is just a total statement. What they want is to kill the, 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 the peer. Get the point. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is, can we be careful with what we are planting now, even for this generation to come? Because the next government, they also look at, oh, okay, this is what they did. They came to our lives, and I think they are showing us how it's supposed to be. You get the point. So, please, my appeal to you, leaders, who are eyeing offices, you know, um, the political offices and everything, can we put the country first? before our personal agenda or before the revenge. And the last thing from me, can 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 this alliance please be serious and see what we can do come twenty twenty six. Because if you keep fighting as the alliances, as the parties, then you 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 you, you, you are not standing a better chance of getting power from the current government. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um your response I think it's just one of the questions Yeah, but, but uh, I do have a second question on my name. Oh, sure. Yeah. I know you can answer, you can respond to it then. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Felix Makumba uh, said um, he agreed with the issue of the, the efforts taken by the courts uh, in valuing, you know, in, in prosecuting these corruption cases where they compare the income which someone earns. Uh, against the current market value of uh, property acquired, uh, uh, as opposed to comparing it with the cost of actually uh, putting up that uh, particular property at the time it was actually put up. And um, 
he gave an example of uh, the fact that he owns uh, a small piece of land somewhere which he bought for a small amount. I think he said 50,000 kwacha. And uh, because of the developments around the area where his plot is, uh, his plot he was able to sell it for more than a million kwacha there after three years. And that was the market value. Um, you know, it records my area submission, which, uh, which again addresses the concern raised by Mr. Sama about the fact that as we execute these national duties when we are in government, we need to make sure that we put the national interest first and not our personal interest. Because when we talk about revenge, which is what is happening now, because in my view, Ruchi, uh, the reason that uh, uh, GBM is in prison today is not because he committed any criminal offense. It is because he disagreed with President Hakan Chiena and left the UPND. That is the reason why he's in prison today. And that is the reason why his property has been taken away from him. So if we are going to put our personal interests, our appetite for revenge, our appetite to show when we are in that position, when the people put us in that position of authority, we want to flex ourselves. We want to show everybody that I'm now the one with the power and my large money will feel my way. We are not going to make progress as a nation. And the key here is to make progress as a nation. So far, our poverty levels, you know, during the KK times, Zambia was a beacon of economic prosperity in the region. We had manufacturing companies, we had this and that. Everybody used to look at us in the region and say, ah, look at Zambia, look at Zambia. Right now, our um, income per capita, our GDP per capita is the lowest in the region, maybe only second to Mozambique. You understand? So let us go our country. And we can't do both. We can't be pursuing revenge, personal revenge, and also growing the nation. We can't do both. You know, it, we can only do one thing at a time. So when we have a head of state who is uh, prioritizing, you know, uh, revenge and pro prioritizing persecution of his political opponents, the same head of state cannot at the same time be growing and developing the nation because you can only do one thing at a time. So let us develop our nation. That is my opinion. Question, for example, how did uh, the Ponte Island Island Game of uh, Yeah. Uh, which their candidate borrowed during our beyond our capacity to pay tax. Okay, so um, uh, of course we are not only talking about the debt that was accumulated by the patriotic fund, but we are also talking about the debt that was accumulated by previous administrations, like the MMG, as well as the debt that is um, being accumulated right now by the current UPND administration. Uh, so, when that, what's the name of that gentleman? Um, Pesta. Yeah. So Mr. Pesta's question is actually uh, disingenuous because he is talking about the debt that was contracted by the PF administration alone. Um, I gave an example earlier. When you look at domestic debt, for instance, the current administration has accumulated more, four times more debt than the PF administration in 10 years. And the current administration has done it in three years. They have moved the uh, domestic debt from 78 billion to 232 billion. You understand? Whereas the PF moved the domestic debt in 10 years from about 38 billion to 78 billion. So they borrowed 40 billion. The current administration has borrowed more than 160 billion. So when Mr. Pesta wants to insinuate that the PF borrowed more uh, than the current administration, the numbers, the statistics don't support that narrative. That was a cheap narrative that was sellable at some point. It's no longer sellable now because the facts speak for themselves. But I don't think you want to how do we I, know you, I know you picked on, on the political okay, side okay. of it, but How do we do that? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because obviously, uh, you and I will agree on one thing. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons, or some of the reasons why we find ourselves in economic uh, challenges that a lot of people face mm -hmm. is because obviously we mm -hmm. have a legacy debt. Yes. Uh, that we can both, I think everyone mm -hmm. agrees. So now, how, how do we, we, uh, yeah, how do we, yeah, how do we uh, address that? Mm -hmm. And by addressing that, obviously, then you can kickstart the mm -hmm. economy. Well, the way we intend to address that, especially if I'll be lucky enough to be the Minister of Finance, I'm just kidding. It's important to have ambition and <laughs> Yeah, um, how we intend to address that, uh, Richie, is that, um, first of all, when you look at the issue of debt across the board, whether it's foreign debt or domestic debt or domestic areas, social debt, debt is relative to the size of the economy. So that is why uh, America owes uh, 
slightly above 25 trillion dollars. But nobody talks about it because they've got a very big economy. And the reason we are talking about debt in Zambia is because our economy is very small. Okay. So one of the things we are going to do uh, uh, under the Council Alliance government is that um, we are going to ensure that we grow the economy. Once we grow the economy, then our debt will no longer look like big. It will be small debt. Uh, of course, we are also going to ensure that uh, the, incremental, the incremental debt that we accumulate is minimized by ensuring that we, uh, we focus on uh, domestic revenue mobilization. Now, when you talk about the two issues of the growing the economy and then the issue of good domestic uh, uh, revenue mobilization or resource mobilization, I'll start with the last one. When you talk about domestic uh, resource mobilization to fund your budget, uh, the key thing is to make sure that uh, you're able to collect the tax that is due to the country. Yeah. And when you look at our economy, uh, the majority of Zambians uh, are quite poor. We can't contribute much tax, you understand? But uh, there are a number of big corporations, especially in the mining sector, who are required to contribute a significant amount of tax, tax revenue. And um, one of the things we'll do as the Tosia Alliance government is, first of all, to ensure that all these tax holidays that were given to uh, the mining sector are scrapped. And the mining uh, houses are compelled to pay their fair share of tax because we need that money. Once we have that money, uh, the big amounts which the mines are uh, required to remit, then yeah, that will help us to make sure that our national budget is funded by domestic resources as much as possible, which will reduce the need for one of the reasons the UPNB have accumulated a huge uh, domestic debt, that 160 billion over three years, is because of the tax holidays they gave to the mines, which has reduced the amount of tax revenue that ZRA is able to collect, and therefore they can't fund the budget. So how do they fund the budget? They go and send bonds to, to borrow from the economy through treasury bills and government bonds to try and fund the economy, but, uh, I mean, to try and fund the national budget. That is not sustainable. We are going to change that. Uh, so, in terms of growing the economy, which is the second issue that I raised, um, <clears throat> if you are going to grow an economy, which you need to make sure that uh, that uh, endeavor is driven by, by, by the private sector. Uh, uh, only private sector driven economic growth is sustainable. And um, uh, uh, so, what is the role of government to ensure that uh, the economy is uh, grown by the private sector? Your job as government is to create the necessary conducive atmosphere so that the private sector can be able to thrive. So what are the things that the private sector needs in order for them to grow and thrive? Um, number one, policy certainty. Because you need to have stability for you to, uh, uh, for the private sector to be able to grow the economy. And you need to uh, look at the uh, key economic inputs. Uh, uh, and those key economic inputs they need to have stability in terms of supply as well as stability in terms of pricing. So when you look at key economic inputs or key production inputs, you are talking about things such as um, uh, energy, you know, uh, fuel. Uh, do we have a stable supply of fuel? Do, do we have stable pricing for fuel? You are talking about electricity. Do we have a stable supply of electricity? Do we have a stable uh, pricing of electricity? Once you put those things in place, which the Tonti Alliance government is going to put in place, then you are helping to create a conducive environment for the private sector to thrive. But also other key variables, like access to financing, uh, not just financing, but reasonably priced financing. Currently, our, uh, the price of finance in this country is very high. You are looking at interest rates of about 30%. You can't grow an economy with those kinds of interest rates. So we are going to bring the interest rates down. And how we are going to do that is to make sure we <clears throat> minimize on domestic borrowing. When we minimize on domestic borrowing, uh, it means that the people, uh, the institutional uh, creditors like banks, you know, insurance companies, pension funds, who buy those treasury bills and government bonds, uh, if there are no treasury bills and government bonds to buy, it means that they are going to have excess cash. Isn't it? And then when they have excess cash, they need to be able to lend that cash and, so that it earns interest. So they will look around for other customers since they can't lend that cash to government. So they will even give you a call, which, uh, which bank you bank with. Uh, let's say you bank with, um, uh, <laughs> okay. let's say you bank with ABC Bank. 
I hope there's no bank card. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so they'll give you a call and say, uh, Luchi, would you like a loan? Then you're going to say, uh, well, I didn't think about it, but uh, how much can you give me? What's the maximum? Then business ideas will begin to run in your mind. And they'll tell you, uh, we can give you two million. And you say, I got ready. And they'll say, uh, we can give you at 25%. They'll say, ah, 25%, you're looking at the business I want to do, it might not be sustainable. Uh, maybe another time. They'll say, well, we can give it to you at 20, 20%. Then you say, ah, 20, 20 sounds good. Then you borrow. And the cost of uh, borrowing will be moving lower and lower. So when the government stops participating in this uh, domestic borrowing, it will have a very significant trickle down effect on the overall economy. And we are going to address that issue. Also, the issue of regulation. <clears throat> you know, regulation, uh, the approach taken towards regulation, especially for small businesses, uh, people want to overregulate businesses. And they want to be unreasonable even in terms of the tariffs they impose on businesses. Look at the issue of uh, basic rates. Uh, rates have become ridiculous. Licenses from these local councils have become ridiculous. You know, one time I was in Kazungura and I was looking on the wall, I was photographing something in like a small shop, which was also uh, a bottle shop. I was looking on the wall, then I saw this license. So I looked at the price paid there on the license. Uh, they had paid 7,500 Then I looked around how much uh, uh, they were selling in that bottle store, which was also a photocopying shop. There was no significant, you know, activity taking place to justify that 7,500 license. So these the local authorities, the way they uh, uh, impose these tariffs on the on, on businesses, it is suffocating them, and you find that. It, uh, most of the businesses are not able to grow because they are being uh, uh, basically suffocated on the ground. So you need to run an economy and grow it. You need to address all those issues, you know, regulation, creating the necessary conducive environment, access to financing, and so on and so forth. And the Tonsi Alliance government is going to address those issues. Uh, let's take uh, one last call. Can you take the call? Hello, Monique. Monique, I'm all right. Um, so what's your name? Okay, I was, uh, as brief as you can, almost out of time. Hey, good morning, uh, Mr. Elvis. How is the UPND? I understand you're defected. Uh, okay, good. Mm. Uh, Restructuring. Um, you know, when you talk about debt restructuring, you are essentially uh, talking about the country being under debt distress and um, reshuffling the payment plan for that debt. You know, like in our case, uh, they extended the payment plan uh, so that the, the debt that is there can be paid over a longer period of time, um, although at a higher interest rate. But um, that only makes sense with you if you. Uh, you are not uh, borrowing some more, or if you are borrowing at a small pace. Uh, debt restriction doesn't make sense in the current uh, scenario whereby the current government is, has borrowed even more than the debt that they restructured. So, so that was a senseless activity in my view. It does not add any value to the overall well-being of the nation. Uh, coming to the issue of uh, fighting corruption, you know, like I said earlier, the, I personally support the fight against corruption. And um, uh, my submission is that that fight, as it is being done, it should be done in a fair and equitable manner. It shouldn't be a persecution 
and uh, uh, again submit to you uh, Richard now as well as the government people. But so far, in my view, there has been no fight against corruption. Everything that has been happening has been persecution. The reason GBM is in prison at Mombeshi right now is not because he was corrupt or he engaged in any corrupt acts, but because he's being persecuted by the current Republican president, uh, probably for leaving UPND and going back to the peer. So let us not um, uh, have a high appetite to, to, to persecute those who have no power when we are given power by the people. Let us use that power to improve the well-being of the people. Uh, because persecution, you know, it's a never-ending cyclic activity. Today you are in a position of authority, you are persecuting me. Tomorrow I'm in a position of authority, I'm persecuting you. The other day you go back in a position of authority, you're persecuting me back. Meanwhile, the London people continue suffering. You know? And, uh, you know, uh, there is this uh, disease that affects uh, people in power, uh, whereby they tend to think that they will never leave that high position of authority. Why? Because they would have been approached by different prayers who would have assured them of a master plan of how they will ensure they stay in power forever and how they will only hand over power to a friendly force who will then continue and protect their interests. But you know, those master plans never work. They never work. Um, as the uh, President Hagai Ndeichirema exercises the authority of his office, especially um, over us who are in the opposition, he must remember that uh, there will come a time when he will not have that authority. And then the people he's persecuting might have that authority. So the question he should ask himself is, how would he like to be treated when that day comes? Uh, he might not be there personally, but he, I'm sure he has children uh, and he has relatives. You understand? So. Let us reduce the appetite for persecution against one another. Let us dedicate more energy to growing and developing our country in the national interest. And Ruchi, uh, last submission. When you look at uh, our country, you find that uh, the number of people who are educated are quite few. Just because maybe you might have uh, most of your friends around you uh, who you went to school with, you might think a lot of people in Zambia are educated. The number of people who are educated who went to school in Zambia are very, very few. You understand? So, when we are aspiring to this position of leadership, uh, you know, the people, the majority of our people who never had the opportunity to go to school, look up to us as the people who are educated in the nation who can help to drive this nation towards better fortunes. Now, in Sewamene, Wolfgang they're going to take a tambo yamba and we'll start fighting and we'll spend a lot of time fighting one another, uh, locking each other in prison, doing this, doing that. Many of the people who put us there are there expecting to have uh, the promises we made to them fulfilled. Because they don't even understand when you talk about uh, the constitution, they don't understand when you talk about subsidiary legislation, proof of and yet we are spending so much time fighting one another when we're in office. So my appeal to the government and my appeal to the president is, can we reduce this conflict, this um, uh, uh, appetite for revenge towards one another and dedicate more time and energy towards building this, this country? And when you look at Zambia, don't you? Zambia is a small country and we are not fundamentally different because the, the things that divide most nations out there is the issue of uh, religious um, uh, affiliation. So you find that the country is divided the way Nigeria is divided, where half of it is Christian, the other half are Muslims. So those are fundamentally uh, different because they've got totally different religious base. Here in Zambia, we are literally one, pe um, uh, one people. Uh, Ruchi, if I was to investigate maybe two or three generations behind me, and you investigated two or three generations behind you, we might find that we are even related. You understand? So this uh, Apathy, the way we deal with each other with so much hatred, with so much bitterness, in my view, is totally unnecessary. Let us embrace one another as brothers and sisters and help to build this country. That's my submission. Thank you very much. Thank you. At least we didn't finish early. Eh? <laughs> so, Mr. Temple went to great lengths um, this morning making, the, uh, making a particular argument. Um, and I think your closing submission is one of interest to me because as you correctly said that there are a lot of people uh, we, a lot of people depend on us. on on, 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 on us. Uh, 
provide them direction. Um, so I want to provide some direction um, to some of the arguments that we had, particularly the legal arguments that we had. So I just want to encourage uh, everybody to uh, have a look at the piece of legislation that we're talking about, part, well, part of our foundation project, which is the forfeiture of proceeds of crime. Uh, let's just have a look at it. Uh, I know that it's not as bulky as other pieces of legislation, but there are two articles that I would like I would turn, I'll ask everybody to turn to so Article 34 and Article 78. Um, have a read through what those two articles say. When you're done reading those, I would also encourage you to go online and look for the um, judgment or the ruling, the judgment, uh, in the case of uh, the DPP, which is the Director of Public Institutions versus Esther uh, Temulungu. Uh, it's available online at uh, gambialili.org. That's the website that you can find this particular uh, judgment. Uh, and read through uh, together with the pieces of legislation that I've just pointed to. Uh, I think that and the constitution and the constitution as well. So, the, uh, interestingly, um, in the judgment, they make reference to a particular piece of the constitution, the constitution that you reference to. So the burden of proof is on the accuser and not the accused. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but uh, they also make uh, a further point that I think people should read. Yeah, sure. yeah. Rather than hearing it from you or me, mm. I think it's best if you read it yourself, and I think that might help you understand some of Mr. Temple's arguments and a lot of my arguments uh, on this particular issue. Okay, thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you.